This week we continue in our teaching series called uh, Stay Positive, which we've borrowed and adapted from Life Church in the States. So as we open the Word of God, uh, let's pray. Uh, Lord God, we ask this morning that our eyes would be focused on you, that we would see who you are, we would see your goodness, your grace. And Lord, as we're in this series about staying positive, that's not to turn a blind eye to the darkness in this world, but it's to see you and to know that you are powerful and you are good. And that even when our circumstances may be dark or dangerous, you are a God who prevails, you are a God who saves, you are a God who brings us to the other side. And so would we encounter you this morning? We pray in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I want to open this sermon with a statement, and that statement is this. Everyone you see is facing battles you don't know anything about. Have a think about that for a moment. Everyone you see is facing battles you don't know anything about. So often when we're having moments and interactions with people, we can walk away going, what's their problem? What's... What's going on? What's, what's happening? That, they seem a bit off. And then we might find out days, weeks, months later, they're actually going through a battle that we had no idea about. And sometimes when we're talking to people, they may not understand what our battles are as well. I know for myself uh, that life can be quite tricky and painful and, and difficult. And I remember last year as we were going through all this stuff around COVID and, and ministry and life, and it was just it was a tough season, a good season, but tough. And a member of my family actually sent me a text message and just said, hey, Nick, I listened to your sermon on YouTube from a few weeks ago, and it just spoke powerfully to me. And they kind of mentioned bits from the sermon and how it meant something to them. And it was this tiny word of encouragement, a text message which may have taken a minute or two. But for me, it shone a ray of sunshine, of light into into a tough time. It gave me energy for the rest of the day. It made me see, oh, these things that I'm doing and, and working towards actually are making a difference. We, we can sometimes have no idea what good might come through a single word of encouragement, how God can use a single word of encouragement to, to change a future, to change a destiny. And the title for this morning's sermon is 100 Reasons to be Encouraged. Because everyone we see is facing battles we don't know anything about. Everyone. Everyone has trials and dilemmas, issues, family relationship problems. And so when we have our interactions with one another, a moment of giving courage to one another can be vital. There's a moment in the Bible which is the opposite of a moment of bringing in encouragement. And it's found in Job chapter 16. And Job has uh, had... Probably the worst circumstances happened to him. All his kids have, have died. He's lost all his property. He's lost all his cattle. And he has some friends that come over to, to cheer him up. And they do a good job for the first few days, but then they start to talk. And then they start saying things like, Job, this is actually your fault. Job, you, you deserve this. This is because of your sin. This has all happened. God is good, and you must have done something wrong for this to happen to you. And Job responds to his friends. He says, I've heard this all before. What miserable comforters you are. Won't you ever stop blowing hot air? What makes you keep on talking? I could say the same things if you were in my place. I could spout off criticism and shake my head at you. But if it were me, if the roles were reversed, if I was sitting across from you and this horrible stuff had happened to you, I would encourage you. I would try to take away your grief. Job says, if it were me, I would use my words to give life, to encourage, to bring strength and vigor. If it were me, I would fight to become the most encouraging voice this side of heaven. Proverbs 18 verse 21 says, the tongue has the power of life and death. Our words, the the choices we make in every single conversation can build faith, can strengthen confidence. We can walk away from conversations believing that God is for us, 
that God will never leave us, that he has chosen and called us. And Job says, if it were me, I would use my words to encourage. Everyone you see is fighting a battle you don't know anything about. And the writer of Hebrews says in chapter 3, but encourage one another daily, not weekly, not monthly, not when Christmas comes, encourage one another daily. And he reiterates, he says, as long as it's called today, encourage one another. Why? So that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. The writer says, encourage one another as long as it's called today. Bring words that strengthen and the word encourage means to put courage in people's hearts so people can stand strong and tall. As long as it's called today, encourage. Why? So that none may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Sin lies to us. Sin will say to us, you can find happiness outside God's will. Sin will lie to us and say, you can work your way to heaven. Sin will lie to us and say, God is love, so it doesn't matter what you do. Just just live life however you want to. Sin lies and deceives us. Tells us what we don't have, what we can't do, why we don't matter. And we, every single one of us, face temptation daily. That's why we need encouragement daily. Not a day goes by where we don't need encouragement. Because there's not a day goes by where the temptations and the lives of sin don't come in. The voice is saying, stop, don't keep going. And because I need encouragement, I want to generously give encouragement. Imagine if that was our attitude, if we realised, well, I need encouragement, so I'm going to give it. Because I need it, I'm going to give it. And some of you might be listening right now and go, oh, Nick, I'm just, I'm not good at encouragement. That's for the people that are spiritually gifted that way. That's for the people that write the text messages, write the emails, give the words. I'm not, I'm not gifted, I'm not wired that way. And I would argue that there was a time when you couldn't walk. And then you got up and you took one step and you fell down and you got back up again. And you kept on trying and you learned to walk. And in the same way, encouragement may not be a natural tendency, but it can be a learned gift, a learned skill. And I want to give a phrase that might be helpful in the back of your mind. It's quite simply this. If you think something good, say it. If you think something good, say it. If you're at dinner and you're like, man, this is really good. Tell the cook. Say, oh man, I love your cooking. It doesn't even matter if you were the cook. Just say, it was. this is a great meal. If you're in a conversation and you have that awareness of like, oh man, I really respect this person. Say it. If you're at a shopping centre, if you are walking along the street and you notice something, if you Think something good, then say it. Because we do the opposite so easily, don't we? And we build the patterns of criticism and unhappiness. Someone makes a mistake and we point it out straight away. Someone stumbles or you know says something wrong in a speech and we tell them straight away. Something doesn't work out and we go up to them and we go, hey, that didn't work out, did it? If we can learn the pattern of criticism, surely we can learn the patterns of encouragement. If you think something good, say it. Because why would you ever rob someone the gift and the blessing of encouragement? Why would you ever rob someone of a blessing that goes unexpressed? In our relationships, in our marriages, with our children and our grandchildren, with our friends, with those who are leaders around us, why would we rob them of a blessing of a word unexpressed? And Craig Rochelle has this challenge, and I think it's a pretty powerful challenge. Because we are so naturally wired to be critical and to express our criticism, he pushes back and he has a a habit and a pattern in his own life and a challenge where for every 100, he has 100 words of encouragement for every one word of correction. Isn't that a powerful challenge to frame our day? For every word of criticism or correction, he balances that with 100 words of encouragement. And we know this to be true, don't we? that our children need to have a hundred times much more encouragement than they need correction. What we see in them, what we believe in them, what we hope for them, as opposed to just waiting them, waiting for them to do something wrong. And that might be actually a good uh, restraining force in our life. Because for some of you, 
If I was to challenge you to do 100 words of encouragement and one word of criticism, have you already used your criticism today? Have you already made your complaint? Then get out there and start encouraging. Start adding courage to strengthen one another. And encouragement doesn't have to be fancy. It's always good to be specific. So instead of just saying, nice job, saying I appreciated something specific, I loved how you cooked this. Man, you were so good when you're talking to that person when you said this. Because we don't know how we're coming across. We don't know if we're doing a good job. And encouragement can change someone's day. Make, make it something normal. And if it's appropriate, be spiritual. If someone is playing a great game, say, you know, that goal you made was awesome. God has given you a gift. Congrats on that promotion. You've been so faithful and God has blessed you. It doesn't have to be strange or awkward. We just practice it. So often in, in the church, I'll sometimes be with married couples and they'll start complaining about one another in front of the other. You know, there'll be a, a comment, oh, you know, he's not a good spiritual leader. Or, oh, man, I wish he would do this. And can I tell you, when people complain to their pastor in front of their partner, it's not going to change. But that compliment, that noticing that small act that can change anything and everything. When a husband who is unsure how to pray publicly stumbles over a prayer, you know, it's Christmas and oh, it's that one time a year I better pray. And he says, oh, God, thank you for the food that prepared these hands and the, the, the people that, amen. You know, like a prayer that everyone else goes, what did he just say? And the wife says, I love it when you pray. He's going to go, oh, I might do that again. Or when a partner says, can we read the Bible together? And the other one says, oh, I, I love doing this with you. You're going to want to do it again, aren't you? That which is encouraged is repeated. That which is encouraged is repeated. And a, a word of encouragement can give us the strength to face the battles that we're facing. And the truth is, for me, and I dare say for you, sometimes the person who needs most encouragement in your life is you. Everyone you see is facing a battle, including you. And you could be listening to this and going, yeah, yeah, Nick, I, I, I connect with that. Everyone else sees me smiling, but I'm, I'm hurting. Everyone else thinks, oh, look, I'm so confident, but on the inside I feel insecure. It appears that I've got it all together, but when I look in the mirror, I sometimes feel like I'm falling apart. And there's a story uh, in the Hebrew Scriptures in the Old Testament of David and his army, and they arrive home to this place called Sixlag. And they find when they come back home, this army, that the enemies have burned the city to the ground, that their wives and their children have been taken captive. And David and his men, who have been fighting hard, they, they come back home to rest and they find that everything's been taken and they break down and they cry. And it says this in 1 Samuel 30. That as his men are there and they're, they're crying and everything's been lost, they say, David was now in great danger because all his men were very bitter about losing their sons and daughters and they began to talk of stoning him. That in this moment of deep grief, of, of loss, that the men start to gather and say, well, this is David's fault. If he hadn't led us to war, we would be home to protect our families. And they start planning and scheming. We need to, to do something. He's the scapegoat. And David has a choice in that moment. And what he does is so powerful. It says, but David found strength in the Lord his God. But David found strength in the Lord his God. The Hebrew word for this moment of found strength is the Hebrew word jazak. Can you say jazak? I couldn't hear you, but I'm assuming you did. And where it says, found strength in the Lord, it, it implies that David actually has a conversation with himself. In the King James Version, it says, but David encouraged himself in the Lord, he is God. That in this moment where his, David's also lost everything, his wife, his kids, and his men are now turning on him, David makes a choice, and the choice is he has a conversation with himself. Don't let anyone tell you you can't talk to yourself. As long as you're having a powerful conversation where you're encouraging yourself. But David Jezak, he found strength in 
the Lord, he, he starts talking to himself and he says, I'm going to trust God. And then after this moment, David asked the Lord, should I chase after this band of raiders? Will I catch them? And God said to him, yes, go after them. You will surely recover everything that was taken from you. That God says, the victory is in front of you. Go for it. But why is the victory here? Because in the moment of deception, in the moment of fear, in the moment of loss, David turned to God. That he found strength in the Lord, his God. Positive words can be difficult to remember and negative words are difficult to forget. And David makes a choice. He actually speaks to himself and he says, I am going to trust in God even when my situation Even when the battle is right here in front of me, I'm going to find strength in the Lord. What you say to yourself matters. What you say in the midst of turmoil and trouble, and sometimes the people we need to encourage most is ourselves. We need to learn how to preach to ourselves, to look in the mirror and say, you know what, soul, trust in God. Soul, find your strength in Jesus. Soul, God has saved you and God will redeem you and God is not done with you. Have you learned to preach to yourself? The Psalms are these private journals and songs, and so many times David says these words, Why are you so downcast, O my soul? Put your hope in God. David knows how to preach to himself, how to encourage himself, how to look in the mirror and go, I know it's tough, but trust God again. He's been faithful in the past and he'll be faithful in the future. Get your Jazak back. Talk to yourself. Preach to yourself. There are so many negative voices out there and in here, but we're going to look to God. We're going to find our strength and encouragement in God. There are a hundred reasons to be encouraged. There are things to say about God that God would say about you. And so as we go into this week, how can we have a hundred words of encouragement to every one word of correction, of criticism, And how can we also preach to ourselves? Because the the Bible is filled with things that should give you courage. The many, many times when women and men go before God afraid, unsure, looking at their circumstances, going, I don't know how I'm going to make it through. And God says, be strong and be courageous. When the Bible is filled with encouragements like you are in Jesus Christ, the righteousness of God, that you are a child of the living God, that you are adopted by him. God has chosen you. You are an ambassador of Christ. You are God's highest official here on earth to reflect him to this world. You are free from the law of sin and death in Christ. And no matter what your past is, there is a future in him. You are God's workmanship. He has created you. There is good news for you this morning. God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power and love and self-control. God will give you strength. Let's pray. Our Lord God, every single person watching this video has their own private battles. We each have our own private battles of of sin, of shame, of darkness. But in you, Jesus, you came, you lived the life we couldn't, of, of a perfect life without sin, and you died on the cross to save us from our darkness. And so we can't do this in our strength, but we can do it in yours. When we accept the gift of grace, when we acknowledge our sin and we come to you and you say, here, I've taken your sin, your shame, your death. Receive the gift of grace and of love. And then from that, we can be people that speak courage where there's fear. When criticism bubbles up in our soul, we choose to be encouraging. We make the choice, no, I am going to, when I think something good, I'm going to say it. I'm not going to go to sleep tonight having unsaid things which could have brought courage into this world. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, would you join me? Let's stand, let's sing.